My name is Mario, Mario Rocha Bonfim. I am a member of the Polish Orthodox Church in Brazil, and I study theology in Greece. The first, or the first Orthodox in Brazil were from Syria and Lebanon, and they arrived in, in Brazil, especially in Rio de Janeiro and São Paulo, the city where I'm from, about 150 years ago. They were uh, very poor people, immigrants, and they started working with commerce, selling things, but very fast, in about 10 years, they were rich enough to pay uh, for priests to come from Lebanon and Syria to celebrate uh, a liturgy and baptisms and weddings in Brazil. And uh, it's interesting that the orthodoxy in Brazil didn't start as an um, official uh, investment of the Orthodox Church. Uh, it started with the members, and uh, especially because back then uh, the, the Ecumenic Patriarchate and the Antiochian Patriarchate, they were living under the Ottoman Empire, and so they didn't have a lot of freedom. And orthodoxy started only for the uh, immigrants, only for the foreigners that were members of the church, because there were some challenges. challenges. Uh, the first one was the language because the liturgy was in Arabic, and, uh, and so it was very hard for Brazilians to understand. And another thing that back then, the Catholic Church in Brazil was very powerful, and so they made like, the, the, the Orthodox priests promise that they wouldn't have uh, proselytism in Brazil. And, uh, and so the church started like this, a little closed for Brazilians. Later on, like the Russians arrived and Greeks, and, uh, and the, the story was pretty much the same. The, the, the Orthodox Church was just for the foreign communities. Uh, very few Brazilians went to church. And uh, because especially the, the Orthodox, the priests, they thought that Brazilians should be Catholic and uh, they had nothing to do with orthodoxy. And uh, like later on, uh, in 1986, a group of Brazilians got in touch with the Orthodox Church in Portugal. They met a priest that went to Brazil to make a, a speech about orthodoxy, and they were very enthusiastic about orthodoxy and uh, about this very ancient tradition. And they decided to go to Portugal to research more about the church. When they arrived there, they met the metropolitan of the church back then, Dom Gabriel, and that was a very charismatic man. And uh, they were uh, talking every day about orthodoxy until very late at night. And after some days, this group of Brazilians decided to convert to orthodoxy. And, but it created a problem to Dom Gabriel because they would go back to Brazil and they didn't have uh, contact with the other uh, Orthodox churches there that were for the foreigners, for the Greeks, for the Serbians, for the Russians, and so on and so forth. And, uh, but uh, they stayed for about one month, and in this period they were baptized and chrismated, and uh, one of them uh, was, was made a deacon, the other one a priest, and they uh, celebrated the uh, Holy Liturgy in Brazil. And from this original group, nowadays we have about 1,000 people that are members of the Orthodox Church. Uh, and uh, in the late 90s, they started being under the homophore of the Polish Orthodox Church. Metropolitan Vasilios accepted them as, as part of the, 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 of the Synod, because like, there were some bishops in Portugal and some bishops in Brazil. In fact, two bishop, one archbishop and one bishop. Like in Brazil, like Dom Crisóstomo, the archbishop in Rio de Janeiro, and Dom Ambrosio, the, the bishop in Recife, in the north of Brazil. And, uh, and it's very interesting like for me as a Brazilian, because I, when I converted to orthodoxy, I converted in the Greek church. And when you go to a church where the leaders are Brazilian, it's very different. It's another contact like this, another relationship. They accepted me, they helped me very much, like the, the, uh, Don Crisostomo offered me this scholarship to study theology in Greece. And, uh, and since then, since uh, uh, 2015 that I've been studying there in Greece, he has been giving me uh, support and, uh, and guidance through all this time. My conversion is very interesting and it has a lot to do with the Greek language. 
I, I grew up in a very Brazilian environment, of course. My parents are working class people. And uh, I was raised to be, I don't know, like a worker as my father. My father is a, a house painter, a very noble uh, profession. I can paint, paint houses too very well, but I wanted to do something different with my life. And uh, I have always been very interested in languages since like uh, I was very young. And, uh, and so in 1999, I started studying Greek. And uh, it was very interesting that my first teacher once he asked me, Mario, what is your problem? Because he was Greek and he didn't speak Portuguese very well. And I said, my problem? And, he's, and uh, he said, yes, because you study Greek, you are a very good student, you uh, work very hard, but where are you going to use Greek? And I told him, I don't know. I like Greek very much. And that's why I studied it. And when I went to, went to college, some years later, I went to study classic Greek. And I, I took a degree in Brazil in, in English and Portuguese. And I studied Greek at the end as a side course. And, uh, and we had a modern Greek in our university too. And I started studying. The teacher, after one year, said, Mario, you are a very good student. Would you like to go to Greece with a scholarship? And I said, of course. And I went. And it was 2008. I liked it very much. I went to Thessaloniki, the city where I live now. And when I went back to Brazil, I asked him if there was another course. And he said, yes, there is one in Athens. In 2009, I went to Athens. And in Athens, I, I met the other Brazilians that studied uh, Greek. And we are a very close community. And uh, uh, by chance, I was going back to Brazil with an, one of these girls that studied with me. When we were at, on the plane go, going from Italy to Brazil, there was a, a, a man sitting behind her, beside her, and they started speaking Greek. And then she told me, Mario, he's going to Brazil, solve some problems, and he doesn't speak Portuguese, he doesn't speak English, he, st he speaks only Greek. And we started helping him, and, uh, and uh, we were together all the time. And uh, one day he said, Mario, I have to go to the Orthodox Church because I have to light a candle for my father. And I told him, Nico, I don't know where the Orthodox Church is. It is so crazy to say that, because now I am so inside the church. And we were looking for the church. We found one Greek church in the center of Sao Paulo. And when I went inside, the, the liturgy was going on. And, I was, and the impact was so big on me. And because it was the first time that I saw Holy Liturgy and in Greek, like a language that I listened only in, in Greece. And I felt something like, and so he went like to light the candle for his father and I was listening like this I, and I started crying and I felt like in my heart, one day you are going to do this, Mario. And I thought, but you, you are here like for five minutes, how can you say that? And uh, I know that I started going back. I went to the church many times and uh, but nobody talked to me <laughs> because like i am not greek and i don't look greek and and as i told before like, it's a very close community but uh, one day like in the homily the priest was and the homily was in greek in sao paulo the homily in greek and uh, uh, but then suddenly the priest stopped and he said something in portuguese and he said like the Brazilians are enchanted by the liturgy. And I thought, I think he's, think he's, he's saying that to me because he thinks I don't understand Greek. And I was thinking, Mario, it is true. You love the liturgy. And so why not join in the church? Join in the church. And so I talked to my Greek teacher. Back then I still studied Greek. And my Greek, Greek teacher, because he's from Kalamata. And I said to him, Dimitri, I'm going to the Orthodox Church. I like it very much. I'm thinking about joining the church. What's your opinion? And he's very Greek and he was very enthusiastic about it. Yes, wonderful. How nice. Yes, you are going to be baptized. And uh, I'm going to be your godfather. And Anna Kutrutsos, like my friend from the airplane, she's going to be your godmother. And, uh, and so, but you go, you're going to talk to another priest that is my friend, a priest that is Brazilian. And the first time I went to the Orthodox Church, like uh, the, for the Brazilians that we have in Sao Paulo, and uh, I went there to talk to the priest to be baptized. 
and uh, it was a day that I won't forget because I arrived in church. It's a very small and simple church, and but the priest is wonderful, Padre Basilio, and it was just him and his wife, and the liturgy started like this. He was doing the orthros, and he was singing, and she was, she, and she was singing along, and the church was empty, and uh, because Greeks go to church a little later. And there in Brazil, there is a book for you to follow the liturgy. And uh, he said the number of the page, and he sang it once, and the second time I sang so, too. And so the, the papadia looked back like this, and she saw me, and she called me with the hand, and I went beside her, and she said, what's your name? So, my name is Mario. Ah, I am Maria, nice to meet you. Stay here by my side and sing aloud. <laughs> and so since the first day, I was helping in church like this. And with him, I, help, I learned a lot of things about the liturgy, about singing, about how to be an Orthodox. And uh, because that, that community is like a, it's a Brazilian community, I was better accepted. But a small problem that appeared like some years later, it's because that as a Brazilian, I didn't see a future in the church. I started growing a beard, I started wearing black because like, uh, when I was a teenager I wanted to be a monk. And, and my parents said that I was crazy because like, I, was, I grew up as a Protestant and they said, in our church we don't have monks, <laughs> so how come we're going to be a monk? And so, uh, and there wasn't a, how can I say, a future, as I said. And some other Brazilians, some other boys, were like attending the church, and I made some friends. And one of them introduced me to Bishop Ambrosio, that was visiting São Paulo, and uh, and I went there to talk to him about opening a monastery in São Paulo. And so it was like like this that I got in touch with the Polish Orthodox Church through Dom Ambrosio. Poland came into my life in a very interesting way. Because when I came, uh, went to Greece to start the college like this, first I had to have a Greek test. And the Greek was uh, at the beginning of June. Uh, the results would come out uh, at the end of July, and the classes would start only in September. And uh, uh, Archbishop Chrysostomo from Rio de Janeiro uh, um, organized with the, uh, the Metropolitan for me to stay in some monasteries here in Poland. Because I, I, I wanted to be a monk, I want to be a monk, and I wanted to have like a real uh, experience in the monasteries here. And so the moment I arrived in Poland, like the church has been, I, I don't know, like perfect. Everything that they said that they would do, like this, uh, they did. The Metropolitan arrived, uh, arranged some visits, and, uh, and I was with another brother from Brazil, like my, my friend Michel. And we visited some monasteries here. We went to that monastery with Father Gabriel. And uh, we had a tour of the Orthodox Poland like this. We stayed for some days in Warsaw. Michel went back to Brazil and I went to Yabuetna for to stay there for one month. Father Atanasi, now Bishop Atanasi, welcomed me in the best way possible. I felt like a prince. I remember one day he took me to the kitchen and they have like a, this huge refrigerator there in Yabuetna. And he opened the refrigerator and he said, Mario, this refrigerator is yours, anything you want. I felt so welcome. And uh, it was so good to take part in the services like this and, uh, and see how monastic life uh, worked. It is very interesting that he, he asked me to, uh, how to put down the candles in the liturgy like this. And I remember that one day, the first uh, Sunday liturgy, I started doing that like this, and every time I did that, like the babkas like said something, and they didn't understand because I didn't speak Polish. I don't speak Polish now. Imagine back then, but there was a problem. There was something going on, and so suddenly this babka came and started speaking to me in Polish like this, and they didn't know what to answer. And I studied a little Russian, and the only thing that came up was like, Nipanimayo, Nipanimayo. And she said, Vistio Panimayo, And so then I told that to Jarek Bauer, uh, and uh, that was there with me 
back then and he laughed a lot. It was very funny. And every monk that passed, Father Sofrani, Father Sofrani, came here, Mario, tell the story. And they told the story and the, 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 the monk laughed a lot. And we were telling the story to every monk until we met Father Makari. And so we started telling the story and Father Makari said, Mama. And so he picked up the phone and called her. And so he asked her, Mama, did you talk to this, to this man in the church? Ah, yes, it was me. Because he was putting down the candles and they were too big like this. And he's from Georgia and he doesn't speak, <laughs> this doesn't speak Russian. What's that? She thought that I was from Georgia. And it was very interesting that I said, Mario, you have to learn some Polish. And I downloaded a book, and so since then, I am studying Polish little by little. And there was this boy there in Yabłocznia again, Mario Szykanowski from Hainówka, and he was my first Polish teacher. Né? Mariusz jest najlepszym nauczycielem. Né? A very, very good person. And he started teaching me like the basic things like this, and since then, all the time, I, I'm trying to learn. And, uh, and of course, in the kitchen we had Pani Halina, I can't forget, and so she makes the best pierog uh, uh, in Poland, like this. I am very thankful for the time I spent there. And after that, I came here to Saki. And I felt very at home here. It was a very strange experience, I don't know. It was like I was here. And I met Father Timoteus, and I immediately was afraid of him. <laughs> because he's a very nice person, but I, he's very spiritual, and I knew that he saw like inside my soul, and I was very afraid of what he was going to say, and I tried to avoid him a little. But one day, I, I started working in the kitchen, and uh, before, I worked with, uh, with Jevo, né? it's something that I don't like so much, and Jevo and Polano, and I found a way to go to the kitchen because I like cooking very much, and one day I was washing this huge garnet because Father Paisius from the kitchen makes uh, feta cheese and tvarug, a lot of interesting things. And so, so Mario, you are still here like this. And so he started having a conversation with me, like to get to know me. And I was very afraid like this. And so it's now. And so he said, uh, and he asked the, the, the crucial question, Mario, do you want to be a monk? And I said, yes, Father, I want to be a monk. And so he said, ah, if you want to be a monk here in Saki, it will be an honor for us. And I was very happy because uh, I was afraid that he was going to say, no, you are not cut to be a monk, for back, forget about that. And he was very supportive. And uh, I love Saki Monastery. I consider it my second home. And, uh, but I hope one day to go back to Brazil to help the, the brothers there. And uh, Bishop Chrysostomos, he gave me this wonderful opportunity to study. And I really want to one day give a little back and, uh, and help like the brothers in Brazil, help other people to come here to study, either in Poland or in Greece. And uh, because this uh, experience in a real Orthodox country is the most important thing. I think that the Orthodox Church here is so organized. Everything happens so well, like this, the services. And the people go to church with, uh, they are so pious, they are so, uh, they have so much faith. And they endure the services and they really enjoy it. It is something like for me, it really touches me all the time. And uh, I love like the, the, the being a member of the Orthodox Church, the Polish Orthodox Church, and being welcomed here in this way I am. And uh, so many people have come to help me, Matka, Katarzyna, and uh, and a lot of is, is small miracles happened because when I came here to study, I, ch I could uh, choose any university in Greece, but I ch chose Thessaloniki. And I remember I was here in Saki Monastery and Father Timoteo said, Mario, I bought this uh, new uh, iconostasis in Thessaloniki and I'm having a problem having it delivered here and I'm going there to pick it up. I rented a truck and I'm going there. Do you want to go back with me? And so you see, I went back to Thessaloniki with Father Timoteus by car like this and he took me there. And uh, nothing of that was, uh, how can I say, I, I couldn't preview that. And another thing that happened later, one day Father Timoteo said, Mario, my nephew, uh, Piotr, is going to study in Thessaloniki too. 
and he is going to stay in this monastery there in Thessaloniki like this. Would you like to stay too? And I said, of course, Father Timotheus, yes, I would like. And so he said, give me your data like this, your passport number. And so he sent the letters to Constantinople and I got to live there. And uh, it was something that I didn't expect again. And so a, a lot of small miracles. And uh, something very interesting, like uh, it was, I, I was here in Saki in, from uh, August, yes, yes, August, no, 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 June, July 2015 to September 2015. And the Father Timoteus one day asked me, Mario, what are you, going, what are you doing for Christmas? And I said, Father Timoteus, I have no idea. And he said, would you like to come back to Saki? And I said, of course, but I don't have money. And he said, no problem. I send you, I send you the ticket. And so for Christmas, I came here to Saki. And Christmas, I was here, and Father Timoteus asked, Mario, what are, you going, what are you going to do for Easter? And I said, I don't know, Father Timoteus. And he said, OK, I send you the ticket. <laughs> and so since then, every I, I spent summer vacations here. I spent Easter, Christmas. And uh, this is the 10th time I am in Poland, 10th time. Nine times Father Timoteus brought me here. And uh, because I couldn't go to Brazil, because the, the, the church in Brazil has a little, how can I say, they, they, have, they are going through like financial problems, and the bishop couldn't send me a ticket to go back to Brazil. And, uh, and so instead of going to Brazil, I came here. And so that's the wonderful impression I have about the Orthodox Church. And uh, in the monasteries, uh, like the, um, the, how can I, the behavior of the monks uh, is amazing. Like the people are here in the monasteries because they really believe, they really want to serve God, they really want to have a spiritual life. I have never seen anything wrong or suspicious, nothing, nothing, nothing. It is amazing, amazing, amazing. The way the Igumans, they treat their monks with a lot of respect, a lot of love. I have never seen uh, people screaming or shouting or punishing others, nothing like that. And so I have the best impression of the church, the our metropolitan. And so you see, who is Mario here in Poland? I arrived yesterday, so to, as we say in Brazil, and, uh, and he knows me, he helps me. I needed a recommendation letter and he wrote the recommendation letter like for me to apply for a scholarship in Greece. And uh, it, these things are like simply amaze me, like amaze me. I, I, don't, I ha don't have words like to thank people. Like, uh, like uh, when uh, Piotr uh, went to, to Thessaloniki, his mother, uh, Matushka Irzavieta Sterlingov, she sent me some presents, she sent me a, a blanket, because I didn't have a good blanket for the, uh, for the winter in Thessaloniki. And so every time I use this blank, that blanket, I feel so thankful, and I always thank God for her. Uh, for, for, because she remem re remembered me and uh, it really touches me. People are always interested to know how I am and they always check on me to see if I am healthy, if I need something. And, uh, and so it is like this, maybe like a, you Polish teacher, my, you Polish people, my dear brothers, you are so used to having all this that maybe you don't see that how good things are here, how organized things are. Thank God, it's like, uh, and, it's, uh, and you have so many blessings that some of these blessings have fallen upon me. And uh, again, I just, I can't, I, I don't have words uh, other than saying thank you in Portuguese. Muito obrigado, muito obrigado, muito obrigado. Religion in Brazil is something very interesting. Like the, the, uh, the, the, our colonization was made by the Portuguese, as I said before, that are very, very Catholic. But uh, since the beginning, they brought other people like to live in Brazil, especially the slaves from Africa. And uh, when the slaves arrived, they were forced to accept Christianism, but they kept their traditions and they practiced their traditions uh, like a little hidden. And there is a lot of, since then, there, there has been a lot of syncretism in Brazilian religion. 
it is very common for people to have two religions. And so they are Catholic and something else. And uh, re yeah, religion in Brazil is a very special case. Of course, and it's not like everybody, 100% of the people, but many people, they have this, uh, this different approach to religion and this Brazilian approach, so to speak. Um, something that I would like to say is like most of Brazilians are Catholic, about 70%. There was a time when it was 90, 95%. Uh, were Catholic, but since like the 70s, they had, the Catholics have been losing a lot of members to the Protestant religions, that nowadays they are about 25% of the population, and, uh, and especially the Pentecostals. Like, for, for the Catholics, I can say that there are many people that go to church, attend Mass, but most people, they only go to church when they need something. <laughs> And so when they need a blessing like this, and so they go to church to ask God to help or, or the saints. And, uh, or they go to church just like for baptisms, for, uh, for weddings and funerals like this. And the, the Protestant, Protestants like this, they have, uh, how can I say, they have grown a lot because they have a different approach to religion. They, they, get, they their religions, provide what Brazilians want and for Brazilians like in my opinion like uh, the most important thing in the church is for the church to be fun people go to church to have fun like for example in the Protestant churches they sing a lot there is a, a, a huge part of the of the meeting is like about singing and so they sing religious songs, sometimes they have a very modern rhythm, like with rock, like this, pop. And so people go to church and they sing, they dance, and uh, they have a lot of interaction with the pastor that is in front, like this. And uh, it, that, that's why like the Orthodox Church attracts very few people, because for Brazilians, the Orthodox Church is extremely boring. <laughs> It's interesting, like, the Orthodox Church is something different. You have to study more, you have to understand what's going on. And, uh, and part, a very important part of the Brazilian uh, society or the Brazilian uh, characteristic is, like, the African religions. Because the slaves brought their religion with them. And there is one, uh, the biggest one, that is called Candomblé, that is very interesting. They, they, the, the liturgy, so to speak, is in a different language. It's in the original language, in the African language, a language called Yoruba, a very difficult tonal language. And after like 300 years, they still sing like the same songs. And uh, they were very persecuted by the Catholic Church. But like lately they have uh, with all the freedom, that uh, religious freedom that we have in Brazil. And so they have been growing and attracting other people. And uh, since now in Brazil, we have a relative uh, religious peace. And so people, they can uh, profess the religion that they want or, or no religion at all. It's not a problem in Brazil for you to be an atheist. And, uh, but nowadays, with the rise of the Protestants, it's a little more complicated. And so they persecute a lot of these people from these African religions because uh, for them, like they worship the devil. And, uh, it, but the Protestants, they, like there is this new group and uh, that they, they are more fanatic. And sometimes they persecute a lot the Catholics. Because Protestants don't have saints, they don't have images, and uh, in their opinion, it's wrong. And uh, sometimes they, how can I say, they go inside the churches and they break the statues like this, they vandalize. Uh, I am a, I'm very worried about uh, the future of Brazil, like towards that. But generally, Brazilians are extremely tolerant. They, uh, how can I say, it's not about being tolerant. Sometimes they don't care what your religion is. It's not a topic that they ask you, like uh, if you believe in God or what religion you are. And so people sometimes, they, how can they say, they work together for years and they don't know what religion like the other person follows. And, uh, and I, I think it's very nice, this tolerance like this. And, uh, 
and uh, it it's it's not an obstacle really i want to say that our religion is not an obstacle for people to live together and uh, what else I, I would like to say is that like the orthodox church is uh, how can i say is a new uh is a new alternative for religious alternative in brazil because it's regarded as a very serious church a very traditional church that uh, attracts very uh, educated people, people that want to read, want to research about history, want to research about the past, and uh, people that are very connected to tradition, and they want to de- to live this this tradition like in their lives, in the in like a, in a Brazilian way, so to speak.